the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heike when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heike? Thus the village of Centerville became Heike. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heike. Two miles west of Heike, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heike and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard, and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heike, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Central Historic. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Harbor of Manitowoc, and Charlie Bauer had called up and indicated he was down on the library, which is across the river here of the harbor, and he saw this bounty making a rotation right in the middle of the harbor to park itself here at the Maritime Inn and the uh, museum also. So I said, by golly, we got to go down and take a look at this thing. And apparently there's no charge for the tours. Man, there's a ton of ropes. Holy cats. For the sails. That thing is high, boy. Sailing ship in our harbor. 
So uh, it just happened to be a fortunate moment yeah, here. I don't really care either. I'm, I work out on the surveys, so sometimes I might feel like you might get in my way, but Therese is going to work with me too, so it doesn't matter. Whatever you want. I'll do it. Okay, I got a young lady here who has uh, some duties to do uh, with the vehicle. I'll use that term behind her, <laughs> but she'll give us a little more information and also her name and maybe where she's from. Go right ahead, please. Uh, my name is Rebecca Anderson. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania, okay. which is nowhere near the water. But <laughs> uh, I got interested in sailing tall ships a few years ago um, through my dad. Uh, I sailed uh, Endeavor. Uh, on the west coast out of Australia. Okay. Um, but then I got involved with Bounty a few years ago, also through my dad um, okay. and my older sister who crewed for a while. Um, I was teaching elementary school. Okay. And <laughs> decided to come do this for a while. Really? Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> um, I've been on board six months now. I got in Florida in okay. February and um, I have seen all of the coastline up uh, all the way up to Nova Scotia. Wow. Um, and now we are in the lakes for the summer. We'll hit all five Great Lakes. Great. Um, Holy cow. And now, uh, as far as Lake Michigan, what, uh, how can I say, what timeline is that pertaining to the other lakes? Is this the first lake, the second, third? Is that how that um, goes? This is our fourth lake. We've been through the others. Okay. We didn't make many stops in those yet. Okay. Um, but we, we will make the most stops in Lake Michigan, okay. I believe. Great, great. Glad to have you here at Manitowoc. Yes. Um, now, your duties on board this ship is what? Um, our duties, uh, we split up into three watches. Okay. Um, so, uh, on watch, our duties are to steer the ship and stand lookout on the bow, um, do boat checks, make sure everything's safe on board, okay. um, do navigation, and then all of the sail handling and maintenance that's involved as well. Wow. Uh, when we pull into port, we continue maintenance and um, and we do tours. Okay. So this is your chance to do some maintenance that you can't really do when you're on... Um, sometimes, yeah, we get to do some painting on the outside and okay. um, some other things. But most things we could do at sea or at the dock. Okay. Now, as far as uh, the sails, uh, do they call it rigging or am I mistaken there? They call it rigging, yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. to get a sail into position, 
What does what is it required to do that? Um, to get a sale, um, right now they're furled, um, okay. which means they're all rolled up on top of the yard. All right. Um, in order to set the sales, we have to take a couple people up there. We climb up there and you're kidding. Uh, no, um, <laughs> oh we we ungasket them. They're they're tied up, uh, so we untie them and they fall in their gear, and then we come back down on deck. Oh, okay. And pull on some lines to uh, pull them out and uh, get the wind in them. Okay. Um, sometimes we have to brace the yards around. Um, What's to get what the, is the yards? What is that the about? The yards are the, the horizontal beams that the sail oh, yes. hang from. Yes. Uh, so we brace those around to get them in the right direction to, uh, to pick up the wind. Okay. Okay. Now, like I said, they're tucked away, and yeah. you had a name for that while they, they were furled. Furled up on, on each of those yards is that correct that's correct okay and what would you call that triangle sail in the front here on the bow um our triangular sails are called fore and aft sails because they run fore and aft or um we call them staysails because they hang from the stays um, okay could you spell that word staysail or what is stasel, it staysail it's spelled just it's a s-t-a-y s-a-i-l okay <laughs> uh, now, does that help to direct the ship a little bit or control the... Uh... Um, sometimes um, we can only sail with our fore and aft sails uh, if the wind is... Um, we can only sail so far into the wind, um, 90 degrees to the wind with All our right. square sails. Right. Okay. So with our fore and aft sails, we can, um, we can have a little more flexibility with, oh, the, I see. with the direction we head. Okay. Now, there is, is there an engine in this thing to help you a little bit? There are. There are two engines. We have two 375 horsepower John Deere engines. All right. Okay. That's a good thing to have, I'm sure. Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> now, for a shift that you would be on, uh, how many people are involved? Uh, each watch has between uh, sometimes as few as three, but up to as many as seven. Okay. Um, depending on how large our crew is at the time. Okay. When you were assigned to a watch, which could be, I suppose, every eight hours or something like uh, that. We stand four-hour watches. Okay. Um, oh, all right. So, um, right now I'm on the 12 to 4 watch. So I stand okay. from noon to 4, and all right. then again from midnight to 4 a.m. Okay. Oh, well, that's how that works. Okay, yeah. very good. And, uh, okay, as far as all the uh, ropes that are to be used for hoisting things up and down and uh, tightening and so forth, are there winches or some kind of handles that pull this, or is this pretty automatic um, now? Or? We, we do it by hand. Uh, oh, really? They do go around um, what we call belaying pins, which hold them fast to the to the pin rail. Okay. Um, so we do use them as leverage when we are hold uh, when we're when we're pulling them tight. Okay. okay. Um, and sometimes it takes two people to to get a line. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as any. Uh, what do we call it, uniform or safety harnesses? Do you wear anything there? Uh, we are required to wear a safety harness uh, when we go aloft. There's okay. no place to clip it in until you're up where you're going to go. Um, but we, we are required to wear them. Okay, I can see that. I'd be, <laughs> I, I think I'd freeze on them things. <laughs> How high are you uh, limited to a certain height that you can go or you can do nope, it all the way? Um, we all go up. Uh, pretty much all the way up. Okay. That's 115 feet from the waterline to the top of the mainmast. Is <laughs> <laughs> it a little swayzy up there too? It can be in the wind. Uh, sometimes okay. it sways some. <laughs> okay. Is there such a thing as a nest? Uh, crow's nest. Crow's nest or something? That is pretty much an invention of Hollywood. Oh. Um, there, okay. there have been things on some ships in, a little earlier than this that could have resembled something like that, but okay. never okay. on this ship. All right, okay. And uh, your, you mentioned your dad was into the sailing thing. Uh, yeah. What Did he uh, get into some kind of rank that was pretty uh, up there, or, or um, what? No, he started out um, just like me. Uh, okay. Didn't know anything, but uh, we, we learned together. Um, Wonderful. And he still comes and volunteers sometimes. Okay. Now, uh, you got board, on board at Scranton? I got on board in Florida. Oh, you, I'm sorry, you uh, got yeah. board in Florida, but you are from Scranton? I'm from Scranton, Scranton Pennsylvania. Oh, okay, yeah. very good. 
Well, I do thank you for taking uh, time out of your schedule to uh, talk with us a little bit and give us a lot of information. I thank you very much. Very good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we got a gentleman here who was kind enough on his so-called uh, lunch break here to help us out here with a little information about this uh, magnificent ship that's uh, moored here. And maybe he can give us his name and some more information. Sure. I'm happy to. Uh, my name's Steve Seanwald. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, I've worked with this ship uh, since 1998, and I sail from two to three months every year with the Bounty. I started several years before that in 1996 with Philadelphia's tall ship, the Gazella, okay. as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I was learning about how to sail on a square rig ship Okay. And with all the lines and all the sails and getting to know the different names of them and identify them both in the daytime as well as in the dark. <laughs> and and then by the second full year, uh, I was proficient at enough so that I then, when the Gazella wasn't sailing the third summer, and I realized this was a real passion I had, mm -hmm. that's when I contacted the captain of the Bounty, uh, Captain Walbridge, and, um, and, he, and he said, fine, he would hire me. and. Uh, and so I started doing this, and I thought this was one of the best things in the world to be able to get a vacation, and they pay me a little bit for it. Right. Now, when I say pay me a little bit, it's like, you know, it paid for the kennel cost for my dog. So we're not really going to get excited about this, or, you know, you, you know if you're going to go out and have a McDonald's once a week, you're okay. Yeah. But if you think you're going to go to the bar or something like that, you're going to run a deficit spend it. But truthfully, this has been one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, because as a man in his 50s, I've been able to um, uh, feel like a kid again. Yes. And you know, I know for instance, you mentioned that you were in the Marine Corps years ago. And if we go back to our youth in our late teens or such like that, we had this sense we were very vital, very strong, and very yep. happy at the time. Yep. We didn't have any of the responsibilities of mortgages or right, raising right. families just yet. Yep. And so I get on board the Bounty, and for the first two weeks, I'm pulling on lines and my arms are killing me. And Mr. Advil is my best friend, you know. But once I get past that two weeks, I've pulled myself together and I've dropped about 10 pounds and then I'm on for the next six or eight weeks. Yeah. Good. And it's just, just what I want, you know. Yeah. Uh, so let's tell you about a little bit about the bounty. Okay. This is an exact replica of the original bounty that was built in England in 1783. The original ship was built as a collier she was a merchant ship, she was not a naval ship, and she was built to carry coal around the coast of England. Okay. That's at the time of the early Industrial Revolution there. All right. The name of the ship was the Bethia, and if you look at our figurehead on the front of the ship, you'll see that the woman there in the riding garb is Bethia. The merchant named her after his wife. Later on, several years later, uh, the Bethia was sold to the Admiralty and brought into the naval service. It's interesting to note that the man who owned her was the father-in-law of Captain William Bly, who then became huh. her captain. Okay. So there's a tie-in there, you see? Mm -hmm. Now, William Bly was 34 years old when he undertook this voyage, mm -hmm. and he was still a lieutenant. He had not risen high in the British service. Okay. In those days, you didn't really get up there unless you had preference, favoritism. And so he had come from, what we say, came through the hawse pipe. He came from a traditional sailor and he was not uh, of rich wealthy parents so nobody could sponsor him so that's how he came into the service he was stuck as a second as a lieutenant, lieutenant yes. and then they gave him the mission to take this ship and to go out to Tahiti in the Polynesia to bring back breadfruit plants and they gave him the honorary title of captain he knew that if he did a good mission he would in fact become promoted to captain so, yes. Can, can I ask you a question? Now, on the little placard out there, it says HMS Bounty. How does, I don't see it on, on the ship here itself, but how does that tie into the ship? Sure. The original ship, when she was sold to the Admiralty of the Navy, all British Navy ships have the beginning initials HMS for His Majesty's Ship. At that oh, time, it was okay. the time of King George the yeah, Third, okay. so it was His Majesty's Ship, the Bounty, oh, or whatever okay. ship it might be. All right. Nelson fought at, at Trafalgar with the, where the British treated, uh, defeated the French, he was on the victory. So it'd be the HMS victory. Oh, so okay. Like okay. So now when the ship was, he was sailing, he left England to sail to Tahiti. That's right. And uh, you have to give me the, the, the voyage. <laughs> That's on 
Tahiti is like below Hawaii, isn't it? It's it's not. It's below and west of Hawaii. It's towards Asia, halfway between. And so the way they went, at first he tried to get around Cape Horn. So he left England in the north, yeah. came down across past the Azores, okay. yeah. and the Cape Verde Islands right off the tip of Africa, the western bulge of Africa, and then cut off on a diagonal across the South Atlantic towards Brazil and down along the coast of South America. Oh, okay. He wanted then to work his way around Cape Horn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, the storms were very bad. He tried for over a month constantly got beaten back every time his men were worn out so after that time he turned around sailed across the south atlantic to cape town south africa there to refit get reprovisions and then head out through the indian ocean around australia and oh my to, to that way around all right that way around oh um by the way just as an adjunct if you gentlemen go down in the ship to the back the stern in the great cabin, you'll see a map that will show you the voyage. Oh, great, great, great. If your lighting is good in a semi-gloomy area, yeah. you'll be able to film that. Okay, you'll great. With that. Thank you. So he got out there, and it took him about eight months to get out there. Unfortunately, when he got there, he found that the the uh, breadfruit plants had were in germination. They could not transplant seedlings at that point. His timing was off. Oh. And so he had to wait several months until the plants were ready to be, the seedlings could be transplanted again to small pots. And during that time, he gave most of the crew um, time to go on board the sh on shore. He gave them shore leave. Sure. And they were in heaven. <laughs> they were in heaven. After bad food, they found that the smell was wonderful of the tropical plants and the blossoms. The fruit was wonderful. The meat was fresh. The Tahitian people were very kind to them, and the the mores, the different cultures from Polynesia versus England, were so different that the mores of the Tahitian people were very much more relaxed than the strict uh, ideas of propriety uh, with relationships between men and women yeah. that they had, for instance, in England. So, what you have here is the different meaning of cultures. It was also at the same time the Tahitians had a caste system. The darker skinned Tahitians were of the lower caste, and the lighter skinned Tahitians were of the higher caste. So, what you have were these dirty, smelly British seamen coming in who happen to be white. White, yeah. Well, they hit uh, how brass how ring. Oh my God. The tooth fairy. No kidding. You know? So, no matter how bad they were, white was what counted on yeah. them. Sure. And their pale skin is what counted on them, and therefore they were desirable. Now, that that kind of like got them entrance into the dance. But very quickly, the the currency, if you will, the currency between the two cultures became iron because the Tahitian people were Stone Age people. They didn't have metals. So they were very much wanting of nails or any metal iron tools. So very quickly, if a guy wanted, a sailor wanted to be with, with his lovely Tahitian girlfriend, she wanted a nail or some other <laughs> in exchange for her services. Sure. And <coughs> they could take that, they could make fish hooks out of it, they could make oh, a hole out of it for sure. making holes, sure. they could use it for different implements. So that's why it was a very practical thing and it was currency. It became yeah. what had value. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so very quickly they realized not just to give of their favors freely, although they were inclined to do so, but also they wanted something. So very quickly they saw that the nails were disappearing from the bounty. They were prying them out and things started falling apart. So they, they put a guard on everything. One day Captain Bly went into a fury because as the launch came ashore and beached itself, the, men, the man who was guarding the launch didn't pay attention and the tiller was hung on iron pintle hooks that go into the back and somebody pried the whole hooks out and, they, and the tiller wouldn't work. So he had to hold a lesser chief prisoner for several hours until it was returned. There was also, there was no concept in the islands of private property. So the idea that you had an axe or you had a shovel uh, was, I mean, somebody else could borrow it. And that's throughout Polynesia at that time. Yeah. And so it was different. So those were some of the, the unique differences of the people there. The, 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 it took those several, six weeks or so for them to transplant the uh, seedlings and get them aboard the ship. Mm -hmm. And the captain took the back of the great cabin and he put, built racks in there like a greenhouse okay. to put all the plants in there in their baskets. He took lead 
and had it hammered down along the side and the floor so that any moisture that spilled out of the basket and leaked through wouldn't be absorbed into the wood floor but could be caught again uh -huh. and reused. Uh -huh. sure, sure. Uh -huh. hey. now, that's right, they couldn't water moisture, <coughs> the salt water. That's right. Uh -huh. fresh water. Now, oh. I, I forgot to mention in the very beginning that what was the mission of the ship? It was to bring back breadfruit plants from Tahiti and bring them to the British Leeward Islands, the British in the Caribbean. The reason was because the, that was the Sugar Islands. They oh. were worth more to England than even her American colonies at that time. So what the experiment was, the slave plantations, all those slaves which were eating fish and beans and rice, if, we, if the British felt if they could give them a cheaper source of nutritious food, they could make more money. Ah. So it was purely economic. Jeez. They want to bring back breadfruit plants, plant them there, see if they could feed that to the African slaves, and would they be able to make more money off it? That was Bly's mission. Now, these, these islands, that they're, they're going from Tahiti, and they're going to sail around the Horn, back up to the islands you named, or what were they? Well, they were going to go to the British Leeward Islands, Dominica, and that, such that's, like that. That's like kind of south and, and what, west well, of Cuba in that area? It would be below Cuba and Puerto Cuba. Rico, between that area, down towards the um, down towards Venezuela, okay. in that area. Oh. Exactly. Right. If you go out there today to the island of Dominica, you will see breadfruit plants that they'll identify as being brought by oh. Captain Bly, but it was not from this voyage. Okay. Because this voyage had the mutiny on board. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Now, they're going uh, back into that history. Now, they are filling up with the plants and everything. Right. It looks good for now. And looks good. Now, we got to get all the men back on board. Uh, uh. A couple of mistakes are made. A couple uh. of mistakes are made. Number one. I forget the exact number of plants that he was told to bring back. Mm -hmm. For our purposes of this brief interview, yeah. let me say it was about 50 plants. Okay. It could have been 75, it could have been 100, but I'm going to just use the number 50. Yeah. All right. Captain Bly realized that there's going to be some attrition, some of the plants are going to die. Uh, They're not going to make it. Yeah. So he figures instead of bringing 50, I'll bring 150 plants. That way, even if some die, I've got more than enough. All right. That was sensible. You would think of that too, except there was one point. His clerk said, sir, if we do that, the plants need a lot of water, prodigious amount of water to stay alive. We can take a lot of plants, but we only have a certain amount of capacity for carrying water on the ship. Uh -huh. We need water for the plants or water for the men. Plants for men. And Captain Bly clearly said, give the plants as much water as they need. Oh. So he created a water shortage for the men on board oh. in the tropics where they're going to need a lot of water. Yeah. That was mistake number one. Mistake number two was that during the time they were out of Tahiti, several of the men there deserted. There were four of them. They were brought back within a week or two. They were caught. The Tahitians said where they were and they were found and brought back. And they were punished. Now desertion in wartime would have been punishable by death. Desertion during peacetime, and at this particular time window, they were at peace with France under the uh, Treaty of Amiens. And so during that time, it was not wartime, so they were supposed to get four dozen lashes, 48 lashes, oh. with a cat of nine tails. Oh. That would have been pretty painful. Oh. So Good. Captain Bly did not believe in corporal punishment. So instead, what he did was he gave them only a dozen lashes, from four dozen to one dozen. By his, by that time, in his terminology, and we would agree, very lenient. Yeah. Very lenient. Yeah. yeah. But one of the mutineer, one of the men who did this um, desertion, was Charles Churchill. Charles Churchill happened to be also the master at arms. He had the keys to the arm chest. Now they let him keep the keys to the arms chest. That's mistake number two. That's number two, yeah. That's number two. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that if a guy deserts the ship, he shouldn't have the keys to the guns. That's a good point. The Bounty was a transport. It was not a fighting ship. And it was a transport ship. And so it did not have a contingent of Marines on board. Therefore, if it had Marines to guard the certain areas, the mutiny might never have taken place. But it didn't, so that's why they had one master at arms, Churchill, who had the keys. So now we have that. Now, how many people are on board the Bounty? This ship is an exact replica of the Bounty, except for one thing. She's one-third larger than the real ship. We have the measurements of the Bounty from the Admiralty. And when they built this ship in 1960-61 in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, 
they got all the plans for her. But MGM, who was building the ship, wanted her big enough for the cameras and the camera angles and the lighting that they had at that time. Today, cameras have been miniaturized, but at that time, they were big, large, bulky affairs. Yep, yep. So, this ship was built, she's 120 feet long on deck. The original bounty was 90 feet long on deck. This ship, across the width, her, uh, her breadth is uh, 30 feet across. The original bounty was 24 feet. Oh. And if you go down below deck, you're going to see, now I'm six foot four, yeah. and the, the ceiling up there, the above me, will be about seven feet up or so. And a traditional ship would have been about five foot six. Oh. So yeah. there's a lot more space all around that gives you a different vision of it. The original bounty was smaller, and yet she had 44 people on board. Wow. Oh. Because she had gardeners, and she had clerks, as well as the crew to work the right. ship. Right. Holy. So oh. it was very tight quarters. Now we're getting close to the area of the mutiny and the question of what happened. Some of the people were dissatisfied. They had this taste of heaven. They really loved being out there. Yeah. They didn't want to go back to England. And so <clears throat> they they thought, let's leave here now. You gotta realize British sailors or any sailors, we're not talking about rocket scientists here. You know, these are guys are not from Harvard. Right. They're basic drives and they said, why go back to England and the cold and the hard trip when we've got everything you could possibly want on Earth here? Yeah. But there were only 12 of them. Out of 44 people, only 12 wanted to do this. And they would have to take the ship to do it. They felt that they could do it because, remember, Churchill is the master at arms. He has the keys to the arms. Yeah, yeah. They can get to the muskets, they can get to the bayonets and the cutlasses. But the one thing they couldn't do, even if they were able to take the ship by surprise, they couldn't navigate it because seamen did not know how to navigate, they didn't know how to shoot the sun with a sextant, uh -huh. they didn't know how to do the logarithmic tables. Okay. Okay. So they had to get an officer to go in with them. They spoke to a young midshipman named Ned Young, but although he could navigate, he didn't have confidence in So he said, no, I can't do this. Let's go get Christian, because Christian is dissatisfied with Captain Bly. Christian had a real love interest in Tahiti, and it was one of the lesser chief's daughters. So we, we know about that. We know from several different sources that she was pregnant when he left. Oh. Now, that's not on our standards of today where you don't want to leave a, a pregnant woman behind. We're talking about several hundred years ago where, truth be told, sailors did it all the time. Yeah. So it was not something unusual. I think I've heard soldiers did it too. Well, more, more sailors than soldiers. So. All right, and so never so. the Marines. Never the Marines. <laughs> Marines don't do that. And they only drink milk and cookies. Here you go. Yeah. So, Christian had this love interest, but he, here once again is a conflict that, that puzzles historians to this day. Christian was a cousin of Captain Bly's wife. Oh, okay. He knew Bly. He had sailed several times with Bly before, years before, in the merchant service. And, and so here was a friendship, and yet now, a year later, eight, nine months later, it's falling apart, and mm. Christian is dissatisfied with Bly, and Bly is dissatisfied with Christian. What happened to it? Why? We don't know. But some of Christian's own words, which you have from several different sources, he says, you're driving me mad, I don't know why, I'm frustrated with you. It shows real turmoil in Christian's mind. So Christian does go in for the mutiny. He says, I'll go in for it, but there can be no bloodshed. We can't kill them. So he doesn't want to have that on his hands, so to speak. So the night of the mutiny, early in the morning, just at dawn, they capture Bly. They tie his hands behind him, he's in his nightshirt. They catch his sailing master, Mr. Fryer, and the other officers. They get them on deck, and very quickly, within a matter of minutes, they have them overboard in the ship's launch. They put in 18 men plus Bly. The other, other men, don't forget there's 44 on board, yeah. there's only 12 mutineers. There's other men that want to go with Captain Bly. They don't want to be part of this. At one point, they even try to retake the ship. They talk, let's, let's see if we can seize the ship back. Let's fight, but with their leaderless, so that quickly dies. It doesn't yeah. really catch right. fire because they don't feel strong to be led. Uh, Bly, the whole time, is challenging Christian. He says, let me go. You're this mutiny. You can't do this. What about my children? You've had my children on your lap, but he's put into the boat. He says, at least give me something to fight with the cutlass. They won't give him any weapons, and they, they're laughing at him. So eventually, his clerk brings, Samuels brings his logbook, brings him his pocket watch and a pocket compass. They won't give him a sextant or anything like that. Okay. They give him one bag of bread and they give him a small cask of water. They got 19 people on this boat. 
the word is freeboard, how much above the water the edge of the boat is from the water, eight inches. Ooh. So it's right down there, eight <laughs> inches, and they're cast adrift in the Pacific. And the oh. ship sails on. What happens is they stop for replenishing water the first day at the island of Tafua, and one of the men is killed by the natives there. So they decide never to land again if they can avoid it. And to make a relatively long story short, Captain Bly takes that, he happened to be the eminent navigator in the British Navy at that time. He took that ship with the, with the 18 men on 3,600 miles in an open boat wow. and navigated past Australia and over to the Portuguese island of Timor and then from there to Batavia, the Dutch East Indies, to get back. He did not lose a single man wow. at 3,600 wow. miles. Now afterwards, some died of disease and a fever that they yeah. caught in Batavia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but during that trip, he kept everyone alive, rigidly, rigidly controlling them with his discipline. At times, he would, they would catch a little seabird that would come on board. They divide it into 18 little pieces, and you got what you got. One man got the beak. He started to cry. He said, suck on it. It'll give you saliva. That's it. So if you got Holy something man. that was of no nutrition, that's what you got. Wow. And he brought them through by the strength of his personality and by his ability to navigate. So he went back to England and he asked to be court-martialed because he lost the ship. He wanted his name cleared. So he asked to be court-martialed. He had his logbook with him. In fact, he was exonerated. He's sent out to Tahiti again. He's given another ship. Gets the breadfruit plants on the second voyage a couple years later, brings them back to Dominica, and they try the experiment. It's a failure. But that's what happened to Captain Bly. Now I'm going to leave Captain Bly for a minute, and I'm going to go back to the ship. Yeah. Now the ship has got men on board. Some are mutineers and some are not mutineers. It's been led by Christian, and now they've got to hide. They've got to do something. They've got the ship. What do you do? They stop at an island for a while and they try to build a fort there, but the natives on that island fight them off. And so they get back on, they sail back to Tahiti. Remember, Christian's the only one that can navigate, so he can find the island again. The king of at Tahiti, at Otahiti, says, why are you back? You just left. At first they try to tell him that Captain Bly died, but he knows there's lesser numbers. So then they admit that there's been a, a mutiny, a fight on board, and they put him off. And the king knows that the might of England is going to come down on him. He doesn't know what England is, but he sees this warship. He sees things that are greater than anything his culture can produce. He knows that King George is going to send a warship out there for them. He says, you've got to leave. I can't have you here. So they put ashore the men who did not want to mutiny and a few that were mutineers but thought that they could stay there. They got 10 Tahitian men to come help sail the ship and they got 12 Tahitian women that were their girlfriends or their women to come with them. And they set sail. And now they go to find a place to hide. And there was an island that they had read about, that Christian had read about, called Pitcairn's Island, but it was misplaced on the charts. They really didn't know where it was. They knew the latitude that it was, but not the longitude. This is the very, very beginning of time where you had accurate timepieces and chronometers at sea where they would be able to find out where they were from distance, measuring the distance from the prime meridian in England, Greenwich, meantime, to any place in the world. Before that, it was all guesswork. So Christian sails around for a while, a month or two, and he finds this island. And Pitcairn Island is about 500 feet straight up, a bluff, and no harbors, but there's one very shallow cove to bring a ship into. So they come into that area, they go up a path, they get to the top, there's no habitation there and they decide this is fine we're going to stay here and so they start to strip the vessel of her canvas her ropes her iron everything because now they know they have to stay here for life several they're going to burn the ship at the end because uh they don't want the ship's mass seen from the sea okay because they know there's going to be ships looking for them a couple of the men are working to um, to help strip the vessel and they get back there before the others and they find uh, a bottle of alcohol and in, in the best of British tradition, they immediately get roaring drunk, and they decide nothing would be funnier than to burn the ship ahead of time. So they start a fire on board the ship even before it's time to destroy her. So they lost a lot of the timber from the ship and stuff like that. But that was the end of the actual ship bounty in 1789.
1789, the okay. bounty is destroyed at Pitcairn Island. She was built in 1783, she's destroyed in 1789. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, sponsored by National Geographic, uh, a man who's now passed away, Irving Johnson, sailed out there on his yawl, the Yankee, and they did diving there, and they brought up her anchor, and they brought up one of the cannons and some other iron fittings, so they, they found where the bounty's remains are out there. Um, now, so they're on the island. I'm going to leave them there at the island now. We know Captain Bly's back in England being court-martialed. We know that the mutineers and their women and some men are on Pitcairn Island. What about the people that are left in Tahiti? Okay, so Captain Bly got back. He was court-martialed. He's exonerated. He goes on with his career. The British send out a frigate to go out specifically to Tahiti to find the bounty and the mutineers. The name of the frigate is called the Pandora. The captain of the frigate is Edward Edwards. And he gets out there, and he had just put down a, a, a mutiny on his own ship, or an attempted mutiny, sometime before. So they're very antsy about this. And they have no love for any mutineer or suspected mutineer. He gets out there to Tahiti about six months after these men have been dropped off there and, and, and Christian has sailed away. And some of the men, are so overjoyed to see these men are not mutineers. They're so overjoyed to see a British ship. They get in the outriggers, they paddle out, they're happy to see them, they jump on board. Hi, how are you? My name is so and so. And they're immediately clapped in irons. Because Edward says, I don't know if you're a mutineer or if you're not a mutineer. It's not for me to decide. As far as I'm concerned, you're all tarred with the same brush. So oh. gonna, it'll be decided in England. And no matter what they say, nobody's going to help them right then. One of Captain Edwards' uh, second uh, lieutenants was a man who had been a midshipman on the bounty. His name was Hayward, uh, Haywood, H-E-Y-W-O-O-D. And Haywood uh, says uh, to one of the mutineers, the mutineer says, don't you know, Mr. Haywood, we were together. I didn't have any part in it. And Haywood says, I didn't know that. So <laughs> turns his back on the man. So they're clapping irons. So the good guys that are there, and the bad guys that are rounded up after a couple of days are all put onto the Pandora. The, to, where to keep them? If you keep them forward, they're going to be near the crew. They could incite the crew to mutiny. Edwards is very fearful of this. So instead, he has his armor take out from the, down to the bosun's locker. He has strap iron brought out, and they rivet together a box, a cage, if you will, back on the quarter deck at the back of the ship where only officers go. And it's, it's just about this high. In other words, I'm six foot four, so it's about five and a half feet high. And it's just a, so wide. Oh. And they put in there 14 men, I think it was. Wow. Oh. And, and it's got one small opening called a scuttle on the top. And, the men, and it's got a lattice work. And the men are kept in that with the sun beating down on them. If it rained with the rain coming down on them, they're not allowed out for meals. They're not allowed out to defecate. And they're all just cramped together in this torture box. And that's where the word Pandora's box comes back into oh, our, very our good, vocabulary. Very good. So they're sailing away, and it's the Pandora and her consort, another vessel who at this moment slips my mind the name of that vessel. And they're coming past Australia through Sunda Strait. Big storm, big storm, pushes the Pandora up on the reef, rips her bottom out, and it's immediately abandoned ship. So Edwards gets his crew off into their boats, and they're going, and he, he says, let those men die in the box. But the one of the men who, I think it was the uh, master at arms, had the keys, opened up the scuttle, and as the water is rising up over their faces, they're trying to get out, but it's only big enough for one man at a time. So several of them were caught and drowned in the scuttle as seven got out. And those sevens are put in chains again, Put into another ship at Batavia and then taken back to England to be tried court martial. Oh. Now we have the records of their court martial, and there's a new book out that just came out the early this past year. Uh, it's by a woman. Her last name is Alexander, and it's simply called Bounty. It's a scholarly book. It's thick. It's wonderful reading, and it's got the minutes of the different parts of the court martial. And and you see them. Some men are freed immediately because it was clear they weren't part of it and others are found guilty because of their actions. Like there's one young lad who had bayonet and he was holding under Captain Bly's throat, daring him to talk. Well, that guy 
couldn't excuse that. That was a bad act. So that came back to haunt him. Yeah. See? Yeah. Yeah. So four are found, actually more than four. There were about five or six found guilty. One was that young man who said to Peter, who said to Haywood, don't you recognize me? And Haywood turned his back on him. That was, his name was Hay Ward, H-E-Y-W-A-R-D, Peter Hayward. And he was found guilty, but his family had some preference, some connections. They petitioned the king, and King George did pardon him. So his life was spared. Peter Hayward went on to enter the Navy again, became a midshipman again, eventually became a captain in the British Navy, and commanded uh, ships here on the Great Lakes in British North America after oh. the War of 1812, and eventually died at the age of about age 53, died young. Um, other mutineers were hung, and they were hung, if you see the, our yards going across here, you see, the yards are the horizontal pieces going across. You see the end of a yard is white, it's painted white. Yep. Yeah. That's called the yard arm. Uh -huh. So whenever you hear the expression, hanging by the yard arm, that's what it is. That's what it is. And they would run a, through the pulley there, they would run a rope around, and then they would have the man stand on the deck with the rope around his neck, and they would come down the other end, and they would give it to his crewmates, and the crewmates would be told to walk aft. And as they walked aft, they would pull him up. Now, if you know anything about, I'm sure you gentle people <laughs> do not know much about executions or hangings, but if you're hanging a person, if you've seen any of our movies or Wild West films, they're always standing on a scaffold and the trap door opens yeah. up, and a person drops down, and what it does is it breaks the neck. And yeah. actually, that form of execution is very quick. It snaps yeah. the neck and a person dies instantly, yeah. or almost instantly. Compare that to the Navy where you're not dropping a person down, but you're hauling them up. They're strangulating them. So strangulation was a very cruel way of killing a person. And those mutineers were killed that way. Others were let go. One was Michael Byrne. He was the blind fiddler. He was taken aboard by Captain Bly to make music so the men would have some spirit. You know, well, obviously a blind man has a hard time in a mutiny. And so, so he was obviously free. So that's what happened to the mutineers. Now we can go back to Pitcairn Island, where we got Christian and the other mutineers there, the 10 Tahitian men and the 12 women. What happens to them? They disappear. We don't know anything more. That's in 1789. We've never heard anything more about them. And then in 18, <coughs> pardon me, approximately 1804, 1806, I'm a little off with my date there, there's an American whaling vessel and sealing vessel called the Topaz. She goes down to Antarctica, that area around Antarctica, comes back into the Pacific, and she needs to replenish her water. So she's looking for an island to get water, and she comes across this uncharted island. And some of the natives come out, and they climb on board, and they speak perfect British-type English. Hello, how are you? My name is Thursday Christian. Thursday Christian. They ran into a son of the mutineer, Fletcher Christian, and suddenly it's clear. Uh -huh. So the captain of this American vessel is Mayhew Folger. And he realizes where he is, and they said, yes, in fact, my father was that. And how many mutineers are left? Well, here comes the story. There were 12 mutineers. There were 10 Tahitian men. There were the women. By the time they get there, there's only one mutineer left alive named Adams. All the other mutineers are dead. All the other Tahitian men are dead. The women are still alive. What happened? Very quickly, they, they started to divide into a racist type war, the British men versus the Tishan women, uh, Tishan men. And the British said the Tishan men could not have any of the women with them. They were only for the white men. They, they divided the land up into the plots, and the best plots went to the sailors. So it was very quick to start agitation back and forth, and in fact, some of the Tishan women goaded their men on to, to do something about this. So first attacking one versus another by ambush, and then a small war started out. Yeah. And it's like there's always a serpent in the Garden of Eden, and in yeah. this case it was this type of racism. Yeah. Excuse and, me, can yes, I ask you one thing they're waiting for me? Was this boat down in St. Petersburg, Florida? Yes. Okay, I knew I had seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, our, that's our winter fort. Yeah. It is a winter, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Very interesting story. Thanks. So, um, so that's why there were, finally there's two men left, young Ned Young and Adams. Uh -huh. Ned Young dies in 1800 from tuberculosis. Now Adams is there with these women and a lot of little children. And, um, and then the British are busy fighting Napoleon. 
They're fighting uh, the American War of 1812. So they don't get a, they're told about it, but really they could care less by this time. It's old history. They finally get to going out there around 1816, 1818. Two ships come out. They, they meet the, Adams is still alive. They meet the rest of the people. They tell Adams he's not going to be taken back for trial. He's not going to be taken back in chains. And, uh, and so, periodically, every several years, a British ship does visit the islands. Adams dies about 1823, an old patriarch. The British public is fascinated by the story by now, and they start sending out missionaries once every five or eight years to give uh, religious solace to these people. And in fact, in this very primitive little community, the, um, the, uh, the Pitcairn Island people are start getting confused about a minister from one denomination and another denomination. So in the late 1820s, they say, this is going to tear us apart. We can't have this differences. Let, we're, we're not that big of a place. Let's be all the same. And so they decide to become Seventh-day Adventists. And oh. if you go out there and you meet any of them today, they're all going to be Seventh-day Adventists to this day. The, um, the population outgrew the capacity of the island to feed itself by the late 1840s and the British moved the population entirely. They evacuated and they took them west to north of Australia is Norfolk Island. It was at one time a penal colony when Botany Bay and such like that when Australia was a penal colony. But yeah. it was no longer used as that so they put the Pitcairn people on Norfolk Island, much bigger, very fertile, and they lived well. After our American Civil War in the late 1860s, some of the families petitioned Queen Victoria to be returned to Pitcairn Island. So the Christians and the Youngs and the McCoys went back, and their descendants are there today. And so you have some on Pitcairn Island, you have some on Norfolk Island, and I, from what I hear, there's somewhere between 56 and 76 people on Pitcairn Island today. It's an aging population, a lot of the younger people want to go away. It used to be they had rowing boats to bring them out whenever a ship would come by because there's no harbor. The ship would stand offshore a couple of miles and the people would row out. And they, there's no need for money. They would barter. They would make wood carvings and such like that, baskets. And they would barter for used clothing or for utensils or books. And, uh, and now even steamships don't go by that more anymore. So there's usually one ship from Australia that comes out each year and one ship down from Chile that takes some tourists out each year. Uh, it's on the itinerary, it's an interesting place, but you don't go ashore usually, and the people can't, because they're older now, their yeah. kids are leaving, so now they have a motor boat or something like that, they're using motors to get out uh, in the surf, you know, so they're still there to this day, and that's, that's basically uh, the story of it. This ship was built in 1960-61 in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, uh, MGM paid $750,000 to have her built for the movie, they sailed her down along the Atlantic coast and through the Panama Canal and out to Tahiti for the movie. So if you rent the movie of Mutiny on the Bounty with with um, Marlon Br no no with uh, Marlon Brando, Marlon Brando, then you'll see this ship. The Mel Gibson movie is a different one, filmed in 1984 by a different ship. That's the Australian Bounty, okay. and she's down in Sydney. She's a steel ship. And they just glued the wood on the side oh. to make it look good. So, stink on her. She's not real. She's not real. <laughs> no, looks place. good, but no, metal doesn't count. No, yeah. no it doesn't. No, metal doesn't count. So, this ship was used in the movie. MGM then had her tied up in Miami for about 20 years. Not really using her. It was, they didn't know have a, uh, a business plan except for making movies. No. And then when Ted Turner bought the MGM Film Library, uh, about 1984, uh, he got all the props with all the movies. So suddenly he found out he was getting bills for maintaining a sailing ship. And uh, so he had her brought from Florida down through the Panama Canal to California. And they made the movie Treasure Island with Charlton Heston okay. with his ship. Right. There she's the Hispaniola. <laughs> they made the movie um, um, uh, Yellowbeard the Pirate with Marty Feldman. And it's a very funny movie, and this is the ship in that. And there they paint one side of the ship one color, and the other side of the ship a different color, because they were too cheap in the budget to have two sailing ships fighting each other. <laughs> so they fire on one side, and they fire the cannons, then they run to the other side, and they fire the cannons. So they end up fighting themselves. Ha ha! We will do it! And we will win, or we will lose. You know, it's like Pogo. We've met the enemy, and he is us. So, it was in those films. Um, she was just in a film this past uh, 
winter and it's coming out this coming November or December. It's for kids. SpongeBob spare, Square Pants. Oh, really? So she'll be with her, your grandchildren or so. Yeah, she'll be yeah. in that movie. <laughs> and uh, she's a sailing vessel. We, we sail about 40, 50 percent of the time. Uh, obviously, in harbors, you were using our engines. It's Coast Guard regulations. Okay. And when it's bad weather or though there's no wind, we, we engage the engines. Okay. Other than that, we're a full rig ship. And we right now have a crew of about 20 on board. 24 is a very comfortable number. We can go below 20 to sail, but then you're doing a lot more work to lift those big sails. Yes. Yeah. Um, to hole up the, se the second yard up at your topsail, to get that up there and drop that sail, you're hauling up about a ton. And Jeez. so you want about 10, 11 people on that halyard hauling it up. And uh, when you get about all the way up and you ran out of air and, and you're breathing heavy, <laughs> And then the first mate looks, he says, nope, you're not there yet, keep going. <laughs> and, and then you know what, it's, what hard work is like. And uh, most of the crew, as I said in the beginning, they're usually average age 18 to about 24, 26. And there's a few older people on board. Um, and it's a very well-organized ship. We have a good time. Very we work good. hard. It has an ethos that is a, a lot of people like this because they feel in a, it helps them to identify with our maritime tradition. It helps to really connect with it. It's not Disneyland, it's not the Magic Kingdom. Uh -huh. yeah, you can go on board, it's dirty, it's got worn wood, it's, it's the real thing. You're talking to people that have experience getting heavy blisters, that have, have worked hard, have, have muscle aches, you know? And that's what it's like saying this. But it gives you a sense of what people went through when they built this country. Yeah. So so we, we like to get in touch, I think it's part of the American mythology. Very good. Sail throughout the whole year? In the winter time, we're down at Tampa, St. Pete. It's our winter harbor, so January through March, we're down there, late December. The rest of the time, we're on sailing at different festivals. Very good. Do you have any other questions? I, was, the, I noticed the wheel is in the back, and the reason the wheel is in the back is so... so the capstan? Right. Or the, or the ship's wheel? The, the, the ship's the, wheel for steering? Right, to run the tiller, yeah. Okay, the reason it's in the back is because although you might be sailing by a compass heading, very often also you're sailing by what's called full and by. The sails are full and you're sailing by the wind. Well, how do you know if you're keeping the wind in your sails? If your wheel's up forward, you can't see your, your sails. Yeah, right. But if you're at the rear, at the uh, stern of the ship, you look up and you can see if the, the corner, the edge of the sail is shaking. And when it starts shivering like that, you know you're losing the wind out of your sail and you can bring the turn the wheel to bring her back a spoke or two and fill the sails again. Okay. So that's why traditionally wheels are always at the stern. It's only with um, with motorized vessels that you find that that need is not, is, there. Is not there anymore. Like on your Great Lake freighters, you can have your steering all from the, sure. the front right. with cables or whatever mechanisms to go right. to the stern. When the wind is, we'll use a term of, uh, or numeral, of say 20 miles an hour, are you really traveling 20, 18, you know, is there some friction that reduces Yeah, there's, the sure, there's friction. We're, we're traveling through the water. Yep. But, you know, a, a big thing is it's it's based upon our hull length and what we're rated for our hull speed. It's also, if you if you look at the front of the ship, it's got the round apple cheek type bows. It's not a, a narrow uh, bow like on a clipper ship. Mm -hmm. So it pushes the water away instead of c cutting through the water. Okay. So using your example, if you've got a wind that's coming off our quarter at about uh, 20, uh, something like that, that would be a pretty nice kicking gale. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we would not have our upper sail set. We would set several of our, our head sails up here on the bowsprit. We'd have our small sails uh, set, and then we would probably set our lower course right here on the foremast. Okay. That would be a good driver. And then the topsail on, this, on the main mast would be set. And perhaps, perhaps a topsail on the foremast here. Those three sails would be more than enough, mm -hmm. and we would be heeled over at about 15 degrees, maybe oh, really? more than that, and we would be moving uh, probably around 10 knots. Okay. 10 knots is 11 miles an hour. All right. And that's okay. as high as you're going to pretty much get it at 20, 25 miles an hour. It is. It is. You know, it's amazing. You get in your modern cars today. You hit the ignition, press your music on, and hit the AC, <laughs> and you're going 60 miles an hour before you're from here to the corner. Yeah. And you think, isn't this the way it's always been? <laughs> and then you get here, and we came down through the night. We were sailing. I was on watch from 8 
to midnight, and we're coming along, ghosting along at just under two knots. Oh my so, God. Just slowly, just coming along, coming along. We knew we were going to be here, but we had no rush. Yeah. And so, when you get on a sailing ship, when you're doing six knots or eight knots is your average, what you're doing is you're stepping off the treadmill of what modern life is like. Yes. And you're stepping back in time right. to where instead of fighting your way to get someplace, you're yep. in harmony with the wind, you're in harmony with the water, and so you're working through the natural elements to get from one place to another time. Wonderful. And yep. so it's, it's, it's a much more uh, relaxed, at ease way of going something and doing work. Same thing when we work through our schedules. We get a lot of work done. We have people working all the time. Yep. But it's not driven at the same pace like punching a time clock sure. as we do on shore. Wonderful. Did you figurehead anybody in particular? Yes. It's, her name is Bethia, and it was the name of the merchant's wife that originally built the first bounty. Um, and the, and the, the first ship was called Bethia. It wasn't bounty. It was Bethia until she was taken to the British Navy, and then the name was changed. So we call our figurehead Bethia. This way? No, I wanted to ask him a question. Did you catch it? Um, what's going on along these shots? It seems like I've seen it. I mean, it might have been years ago. Uh, well, they go down to St. Petersburg, Florida. Some workers up there on the, the ropes, and I think there's probably a name for that, but I don't have that. You might have saw her. She might have gone to. Only in the 1960s, but I doubt it. Right, right. It's, um, he was in the last five years. There's, um, Rosie's out there. Lady Washington's out there. I'm not sure which ship it was. Um, okay. What a beautiful one. I'm not sure which one was the last one. The gentleman here who has provided a lot of information before, and uh, he intends to do that again. Go right ahead, please. Okay, I've got a gentleman here who was kind enough to talk to us earlier, and he's got some more information about this uh, beautiful ship. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself and go on from there, please. Okay, I'm Steve Schoenwolf in Philadelphia. I'm one of the members of the Bounty, one of the crew. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the ship's wheel. This is how we steer the ship. This is called the helm, this whole area here. Okay. And this wheel is a piece of cinema history because the first movie that MGM made for Mutiny on the Bounty was in 1935 with Charles Lawton. Okay. And Clark Gable. And Clark Gable played Fletcher Christian. Okay. And Charles Lawton played Captain Bly. This is the wheel that was on that ship in 1935. So this is where Clark Gable had his hands. This is a piece of history, so to speak. Yes. When they finished with this movie in 1935, they took this wheel off of that ship and put it on their sound stage. Other movies that they made where they used the sound stage after that point, uh, the actors would be working indoors. So John Wayne made the movie The Wake of the Red Witch, and he was using this, this helm again. Okay. When they built this ship, 1960-61 up in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. That's when they removed it from the soundstage at MGM Studios and they put her on this ship that we have here today. So then you have uh, Marlon Brando acting as Fletcher Christian with this. You have um, the, the movie uh, Treasure Island with Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston was with this one. And you have many wow. other actors. Wow. There. So this is a bit of film history and it's by Using this is actually how we steer the ship. 
Right. Yeah, the wheel locked down yeah. right now, so we can't do yes. it. Yes. But by turning this, you're moving a two-ton rudder. It's in the back. And it's all done with friction of the ropes going over it and back to pulleys in the stern. Now, the gentleman that does the steering, is he the uh, leader here that indicates to how many sails he wants uh, no, set up or anything? You'll, on each watch, you'll have a mate. Okay. Different mate for each watch, whether it be first mate, second mate, or third mate. However, the crew, the different members of each watch, take a turn, a stand at the helm, at the wheel, okay. and usually they're half-hour tricks. All so right. we'll be at the helm two times for a half-hour each. It might be somebody like myself, or it might be a young lady that's five foot two and weighs 100 oh. pounds, and that's her job at it. Okay. In rough weather, then we'll put two people on the helm. There'll be a one on either side uh -huh. because of the kick of the water against the, the uh, rudder makes it difficult for one person to have it. And okay. there have been times where a person has actually been thrown over the wheel oh my gosh. because of the kick, where it's just lift them right off the ground. They end up hitting the pin rail on the other side. Okay. In the old days, when they actually did have the ships going and they had big hurricanes and stuff like that, they would take them in, they would put a belt around them, and they would tie them down to the grate. They'd tie them into the deck so that if the wheel kicked, it wouldn't throw the man overboard. Oh. And they still would have two men on the wheel. The Germans used sailing ships right through the 30s, as well as the Finns, and they had double wheels where you had a wheel and a wheel in the rear. You'd have four men on the wheel. And Holy man. Like that. Oh. And uh, they'd be out, out like this in rain, hurricane, or whatever it might be. They'd just be wearing their rain gear. And the purpose of the great here? Oh, uh, just simply to give you elevation to see further. Okay. Keep your feet off the deck, that if you've got water coming down, ah, so that so you're not, it keeps yes. you a little bit drier, drier right. and it gives you a little more elevation to see over the, the bow of the ship, to okay. see forward. Now, in the olden days, without the engines on board, they had to sail this into a port. That's right. And uh, moor up to something. That's right. What they would do, even before tugboats, and they had steam tugs as early as 18, late 1830s and certainly early 1840s. Um, before that, they would sometimes get to a port and they'd sail back and forth or just wait out there if there was no wind until they'd get a wind, a favorable wind to take them in. Okay. And um, when you, you know, I come from the Atlantic coast, though so there we're used to tides and they would come in with the tide so oh. far every day. <laughs> Philadelphia is 12, uh, 12 hours by motor sailing up from Delaware Bay and there if you look at the map you'll see certain towns along the uh, the Delaware River yeah. starting with Newcastle Delaware and then Wilmington Delaware and then finally in Chester True. Pennsylvania and then Philadelphia Pennsylvania they go back to colonial times because a sailing ship could come up the river so far on a tide with some wind and then when the tide ebbed and was going out again the current was taking you out you would just anchor at that point each one of these cities are exactly one tide apart. So that's how they would do it. Here on the Great Lakes, you, would, you don't have the tidal effect as much as you wait for wind. Right, right. And you come in. And of course, as I said, by the 1840s, you would have steam tugs that could come out and pull them in. But if they sailed into a port like this, and they would get close to the dock, and those captains knew how to lay a ship right alongside. Amazing, amazing. And, uh, without, without any problems, mm -hmm. and without engines. Okay. That's, that's amazing, that's, without engines. It? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking here on the side of the rail, is it called the rail? Yes, rail. What are these called and what are they used for? Well, you know, that's the pin rail there. A pin rail, okay. This is the pin rail, these yep. are the pins, and we have different lines on the pin rail. And the reason, the reason they're loose and the reason they turn is that if you had a hard piece here and you tied on your line to it, and something snagged the wall and you had stress, you want this to break first before you're gonna pull something apart up above. Oh, okay. So they're, they're very strong, but they're, they yeah, will give first. They will give first. Oh, Secondly, yeah. they turn because when you have the ropes going around them, okay. you don't want something solid that's gonna just wear a hole, wear a groove <laughs> in order to chafe on the rope. This yeah. way it turns on it and there's no chafing. Okay. Yeah, so that, these are the belaying pins. Okay. And then if you notice, when we wrap a line around it, yes, it's wanna... not tied in a knot, it's just wrapped on it, so friction holds it right in place. Okay. You see? So we have this coming off, and it's just basically wrapped around, crisscrossed like a figure eight three times. Okay. And right. that's enough to hold it oh, tight. Okay. And then Top we and just, bottom. Yeah. Okay. And then we just simply 
lay this on sure. to hold it in place. Okay. So that's what they're for. All right. Any particular, is there any particular rope that was used for sailing that lasted, the, or was it just hemp or whatever? Well, they, in those days it was hemp. They don't use hemp hardly at all anymore. You know, okay. Um, you have to correct the camera. These are not called ropes. They're, called they're lines. lines. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad you're here. He's your friend. Uh, I'm glad I let you do that. We're trying to get it technically right. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Sure. Yeah. So today, this is more of a, um, a modern type rope. There's going to be some synthetic in it. Okay. Um, the sails are more of a Dacron type of material rather than canvas. All right. They last longer than are quite as heavy. And that's perfectly acceptable. You okay. Two traditionalists. Now I, I see two people that are up part way up that ladder or rope. No, I'm, I'm sorry. The shrouds. The what again? The shrouds. Okay. And they're in what some they kind doing? of repair work. <laughs> up the... Yeah. What you have is there's two types of rigging on the ship, and if you look at all these lines, they're white. Okay. So all the white lines are called running rigging. If you look behind me here, at this material here, this rigging yeah. is all black. Yes. That's called standing rigging. Standing okay. rigging. Okay. So the standing rigging goes up either side of the mast. All right. And it helps to hold the mast in place. Okay. It's rigid. It's more rigid. Right. Then there are parts of it, we call them stays, that come back from the top of the mast. They come back. They're called back stays. They hold the mast from going forward. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to kill that for one minute. I got to. Especially Yeah, this is. I, I'm. I don't know what they would call that. I don't think the ship came with cannons. I don't know. Maybe just protection type things or signaling. Huh? Charlie is here. He can take off his glasses for a minute. Well, I probably see the camera then, huh? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> this is uh, one of the masts that comes from up on top. Probably goes all the way through the bottom, anchored into the, the keel, isn't it? I would say, yeah, I would say. How big a diameter do you think that is? Two feet or a little better. Okay. <laughs> Pretty big. Yeah. Very good. This is pretty neat. This is the birthing. This is 
staircase up to the top. Where he, he had trouble getting her on that and he backed oh, off. Okay. And he went back. <laughs> and he went the opposite direction. Oh, okay. Okay. So these are the Keston bars. Um, and there would be a line that wraps around around here and then it would uh, wrap around here yep. and an anchor tackle would go all the way up forward to the anchor and then it would tail off of this side here. Okay. So, um, could you take it all the way around? That'd be good. I could take it around. Um, it's really easy right now but normally it's not as easy and normally there's lines going here so you have to step oh, over the line. Oh, I see. Oh. Over the line over there. Yes, yes. Um, so you'd have up to about six bars in here with uh, one or two people on each bar. Okay. Um, and oh my. It can take up to three <laughs> hours to raise the anchor. Oh. This way. <laughs> and besides the anchor, what else does it raise? Um, we can raise pretty much any. We can do any kind of heavy lifting we have to do. Sometimes uh, we can raise our yards. Um, how would you do that? Eight. The yards or the, the pieces that come across. So how would how would you bring that to this to raise that? Um, in, a, in a similar way, this is our um, this is the, the line he's got right there. Um, that's our halyard for the second uh, yard up. That's the topsail. Oh, okay. Top yeah. okay. That's the one. That's the one that we raise most often when we set that sail. Um, okay. So we would we would rig it up. Um, you take it off that pin where yeah. it's on now. Which one does this raise? The second. The second one up. Yeah. On the on the main mast. Yeah. How often do you have all the sails? Not a 
as often as we'd like. Uh, <laughs> we, the wind's been against us quite a bit, um, but we sail with at least two or three of them most of the time. Okay. Uh, it, it can give a pretty good heel sometimes uh, and lean, um, so you're walking crooked, but <laughs> um, but it stays pretty steady even like that, so it doesn't okay. hinder you too much. Thank you. Mr. Brower, if you'd like to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if we covered what was on, what the ship is made out of, so if you want to start on the outside and explain what, what the wood is on the outside, this up here looks like mahogany to me. I'm not sure what that is actually. Um, the outside of the ship, the hull is made out of uh, three inch thick white oak. Okay. Uh, the deck here this is deck right here. Douglas fir. Douglas fir. And what's what do you put in between the deck here to keep it from raining downstairs? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a it's a bit of a process. Um, you put in first a layer of cotton and then a layer of oakum which is uh, the leftovers from a flax plant sure. um, when, yep. you, when you make linen. Yep. Uh, and then uh, it gets filled in with um, a kind of tar, like a, a, a marine tar. Okay. Uh, which gets heated up and boil into a boiling and oh. then it gets poured in. And right. now this material in between your planking up here or your decking, is mm -hmm. the same kind of stuff you would put on your hull that on the outside? The, it's the same kind of stuff. Um, they don't put um, they gotta put oakum in there, don't they? They do. They do put oakum in there. Yeah, that's correct. So, the tar, I believe, is different okay. because you can't pour the tar. Right. Right. Uh, what would that be on the hull? On the hull, it's oak. White oak. White oak. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Please. All right. This is the helm. Um, it has 13 turns around the drum. Okay. That is supposed to be okay, for good luck. Uh, the center is marked uh, with a whipping, so you can glance at it and look um, and know that there's six lines on each side. And, okay. And then you're at midships. Yes. And, it, and this uh, center pin is also marked the king pin. All so you right. know you're uh, at midship. Okay, let me get a shot of that. That has that. Um, it's got a Turk's head on it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, and the lines cross underneath. Um, so that when you turn the wheel right, the ship will go right, and when you turn the wheel left, the ship oh, will okay. go left. Um, they run underneath of these brakes okay. along the outside of okay. board of the ship. Um, There's pulleys out there, I presume, of some There of are shivs. Shivs, in the, okay. In there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got the rope, uh, rope line, is that correct? The line leads back here through another shiv. Yes. And then through a set of pulleys All and right. back to. Um, back to the tiller. Oh, that's the uh, tiller. Which controls the rudder down beneath us. Oh, okay. And I see you got some stop points. Uh, yep, that. these are the rudder stops. All right. Um, so it won't go too far. Okay. So there, there is sort of a uh, amplification of power with the, what do you call them, pulleys now? Block and tackle. Block yeah, and tackle. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That's and right. you did the rigging you said for this? I did with, okay. with somebody else. Yep, we re-rigged it. It used to just have a set of single blocks here. Oh. Um, but we put in these double blocks uh, to give ourselves more purchase and hopefully uh, make the wheel easier to turn. Oh, okay. Uh, How hard does that wheel turn now, the way you got it rigged? It's, it takes some work uh, most of the time. So you, you just can't it, does, it doesn't spin like a lot of... You just wheels, can't you put see. one hand on it and kind of steer it. You, you um, gotta actually... Some, sometimes you can, but most of the time you put two hands on it to it. Okay. All right. Do, have you ever steered your uh, ship here at all? Uh, we steer it all the time. Okay. Uh, we rotate through our watch. Um, okay. Everybody takes a turn steering. All right. Now... Uh, I'm looking around for some way of guiding this ship to keep it on some course. Is okay. there something you look at to guide this? Uh, yeah, we have charts, uh, which the mates use um, to plot our course, the, our intended course that we should be taking. Uh, and most of the time we use a compass and follow a compass course. Okay. Sometimes we use landmarks, uh, especially right. as we're heading through a channel or heading into a port. All right. Then we would um, stop using the compass and they would guide us through okay. steering. Now the compass, is that located around here? Or? The compass is right in front of the helm okay. uh, in the binnacle. 
Okay, just one second. The side which is the port side of the ship. Okay, this is the starboard side. And which is and that which is the port side. So we're facing so towards right, the front. Towards the front. So right right is starboard, starboard, left is port. Okay. Um, That's for us land lovers. <laughs> <laughs> so if there were another sailing vessel coming from your starboard port side, side, they would have the right of way. Because uh, they have us. Because they have the green. Oh, okay. how, that's how I remember it. And oh, then, okay. but if there were a sailing vessel coming from our port side, then we would have the right of way. Okay. Okay. Now we have to get back to the helm here and see where this compass is. <laughs> okay. Very good. Compass is in there, huh? The person, oh. at, the person at the helm is always on this side. The person at the helm is um, usually on this side because the compass would be right compass in front of them. Okay. Um, sometimes we would have two people at the at the helm. Okay, and that is a true magnetic type compass. It's it not is, a, it is a it's not compass. a gyroscope effect or anything. It's uh, strictly compass. The compass. Okay. The old days. <laughs> yeah. We also have a radar screen behind there and oh, yeah. a depth uh, sounder. I see. Yes, I see. Uh, okay. Some of that modern day wizardry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that that's all. It's it's all done. That's huh? all that's there. And there is a light in there uh, for at night. Okay. Uh, this young lady has done it. Nobody else on this ship has barely done it and uh, <laughs> we'll get it right from her mouth uh, as she is trial it out. Go right ahead please. Okay, um, this is how we steer the ship. Okay. Um, it usually takes a bit of work to steer it. All right. Um, uh, usually takes little little minor adjustments okay. um, to get on and stay on the, your course. Okay. Um, is, uh, I'll just ask this question pertaining to the wind. If you got something from the back uh, pushing you straight on, oh, yeah. uh, is the steering uh, less difficult rather than if it's coming from starboard or port it, side? Um, not necessarily. It also a lot depends on the current of the water you're in as well. Oh, okay. So um, it it depends on a lot. I've been in some water that seemed extremely calm and with not much wind, and it's still extremely hard to steer. Okay. But, I've also been in some pretty good storms where it seems pretty easy, so I don't, I don't know exactly all the factors that go into it. I have another question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there's a lot of roll out there, but must you constantly play the wheel into the roll and then bring it back like you would on a smaller ship to stay um, on course? To an extent, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, I do thank you. Very good. Very knowledgeable. <laughs> How many miles of, of the white line? The running rig. Running rig. Okay. Wow. All I see is a lot of lines. Yeah, think about it. Think about it. Ah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Holy man. <laughs> a little multiplication. I'm going to throw, throw answer on maybe five miles. Close. Close. A little higher. Really? A little higher than five miles. Under 15 and it's over five. Over 15. Under 15. <laughs> Five. Ten miles? Ten miles. Really? Ten miles ah. running rain. My God, Lizzie. And uh, it took oh. me about two months to learn all these lines, you know? <laughs> I bet it did. Uh, but you can't learn them. I mean, it's just repetition day so, after day. So when the, when the, when the captain the hollers out that such and such a mast, each mast has a, a number or four, four mast, mast, mid and aft? Four mist, main mist, mizzen. Okay, and then they want you to, to raise the, the second yard arm or so the the order to do that would be uh not raise the uh topsail on the, the main topsail. Yeah. yeah. And so you have four yards on uh well on your main mist and your four mist you have four yards. Yards are the perpendicular uh, beams going across. 
and it starts from the course, which is the heaviest and the, the thickest set, uh, goes to the topsail, the gallant, and then the royal, it's that toothpick looking one. Yeah. Um, and so when they give us an order, maybe like, oh, go strike the, the fore topsail, then you know what topsail it is, you know, main fore topsail. Right. So you go do the fore topsail, you know, strike the fore royal, or royal, you know, instead of the main royal. Um, so that's how you understand the orders. Okay, so when you drop it, then must somebody go up there and also tie it to the so the canvas isn't flopping? When yes, you uh, so when we say strike, uh, striking means that we will haul up the clues, uh, a sails, uh, square sole square, I mean that's what they're called. Right. Uh, and at the corners there are the clue are uh, the clues, um, and attached to that are the clue lens and then uh, sheets. Sheets um, sheets lower the sail so it comes down and it spreads out nice. Right. Okay. And clues haul it up. Yep. Um, and so when we strike a sail, we'll haul the clue lens up and we'll take the bunt lens. The bunt lens are so you got your clue lens here, clue lens there, so it folds up. Yeah. Bunt lens will do the middle part of the sail, so it folds up. You know, goes like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll strike all the sails in a storm or whatnot, uh, but when we have time, we'll say topmen aloft and to go furl, and they'll say which one you want to furl. You know, topmen aloft to go furl, furl the main uh, topsail. So we'll go up there and we'll climb out up on the yard and the foot rope, um, and one person will be calling the orders. Um, you know, uh, start swimming for you know the reef points. Reef points are these lines that dangle down the. Uh, Sale, oh, that's and right. They'll give us the orders how to do it, and we'll uh, we don't say one, two, three, or anything, we say two, six. And on six is when you, you uh, everybody works together, yeah. um, kind of like heave ho, yeah. Okay, uh, if I may ask, uh, we didn't get your name and uh, your rank, rank, or, uh, <laughs> my rank, my rank, and uh, how long were you actually from before you got on this ship? Um, I'm actually a forest ranger from Montana, okay. Uh, I go to school out there, uh, originally from Chicago, okay. Uh, Travel while you're young, you know, you see yes, the world. Yes. Also a photographer. Uh, my name is Jeff Osmick. Uh, Hi, Jeff. I'm a deckhand aboard, but I'm also the director of the cadet program. We have uh, a cadet program uh, for 13 to 18 year olds. And for six weeks they come on board, and basically we're in I'm in charge of them. And uh, I teach them everything from, you know, tying knots to uh, learning how to furl sails to sail theory, celestial navigation. And we'll have professors come aboard. And these professors will also teach more in depth things like salvage right laws and, and uh, more maritime history uh, sure. than I ever would know at right. the moment. Right. You know? right. um, and so, hopefully, at the moment, um, this is my first year being the, the program director, but uh, we have questionnaires. I give them questionnaires like, what did they learn? What would they like to learn? What goals? And so, if they want to learn more about navigation, we'll, we'll schedule a course, you know, sure. and then have someone direct a more in depth navigation, uh, right. okay. factoring right. in current leeway and whatnot. Or, or more sail theory. Sure. Now, now, when when you're when the captain hollers out to lower the sail and such and such a thing, there, how do you know? Is is every deck hand trained to know every part of the rigging and how it works, or is there just certain people on that go up on, on this particular one and this one, or or how does that? Uh, work? No, uh, it's experience. Um, as you come on and you're and you're a brand new person, I've been on for right uh, ahead. a little under three months. Sure. Uh, you don't know anything, you just right kind of fall around, you wait for people to no problem. say, hey, you know what, uh, come on, help me with this. And after you do it, after you do it, it's day after day after day after right, day, you right. start learning the lines. And there is a pattern to how where these lines lead. Right, uh, right. They're exact same on the opposite side, right. yep. so that helps. Uh, so you got your starboard and your port. But you are trained, uh, you aren't really trained, they'll sit you down and tell you how to do stuff. You, you learn as you go. On the job, uh, kind of. On yeah. the job, yeah. And yeah. yeah. hands-on approach, and you learn real quick. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Uh, the way it works is, if a sailor could produce a female leg underneath a, uh, from his blanket in his hammock, he was uh, he was excused from watch in the morning. Ah, uh, yeah. shake, so leg. shake a leg. So you stuck out a female leg, <laughs> make sure that you had a companion oh, yeah. in your hammock. Um, and then there's son of a gun, and there's a whole bunch. Son of a gun, you called someone that because they were conceived on the de the, the gun deck. The gun deck. Okay. So it was son of a gun. Insult. Okay. Um, there's Not, a whole bunch of cool okay. things. Like why you don't eat with your elbows on the table is my favorite. Why is that? Uh, <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, all right. So back then, back in the uh, 1800s, sail, uh, the British Navy was hard pressed to find sailors, and so they had press gangs go out. You know, so let's say uh, we only six deck hands on the ship. We want to find more people. With, they don't want to be hired on. You know. So what we'll do? Well, what you know, what sailors used to do is they go out to all the bars and taverns and whatnot. 
Um, they look for you know people that, that get drunk or whatnot. If they didn't want to buy a couple drinks, they can take up a laying pit and beat them over the head unconscious, <laughs> drag them back to the ship, chain them up, and a couple miles from uh, out at sea, they'd be like, they release them, say, hey, you're a sailor now, you know? Uh, two years, you know, you'd be stuck in the ship. Um, however, they didn't want to drag just any ordinary person who happened to be drinking at that tavern like a farmer, you know, because they have no sailing experience. Um, the way the elbows come into play is at sea, you know, you're on your pitching, you're rolling around, yeah, yep. yeah. and you uh, want to pin your plate between your elbows and your drink so you don't lose any of your food, right? right. Exactly, yep. just like that. Yep. Just, you know, yep. pin it there so yep. it doesn't rock. And uh, <laughs> one of the reasons mothers, one of the reasons, there's two reasons, one of the reasons mothers taught their kids not to eat their elbows on the table, because when these press gangs went out, the thing they would look for is people at the bars and taverns eating their elbows, because it means, it usually meant they had <laughs> that sailing experience. You experience. betcha, you betcha. Uh, yeah. And, uh, the other reason, so mothers, they want their kids to get knocked on the head, you know, yeah. and dragged off the sure. ship for a couple of years and disappear. Um, the other reason is sailors were the lowest of the low lives, you know. Uh, oh, no one wanted yeah. to be seen as a sailor, so which is why mothers also told out, you know, don't look like a sailor. You know? Oh, okay. Uh, Very good story. Thank now, you. Now, I'm going to ask you, keep your nose to the grindstone. Where did that one come from? <laughs> keep your nose to the grindstone? Yeah. Uh, probably some kind of blacksmith thing. No, it come from the miller. The miller that ran the water wheel that ran the grist stone. Yeah. And he had to keep his nose to it so it wasn't getting hot. He could smell the wheat burning as it was oh, burning. Oh, really? Yes, that's where that came from. <laughs> oh, wow. So now you that. learn something and I learned something. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so you don't smell it. Okay, so what happens if when it got too hot? How would too he hot, then he had to sl slap the wheel down and he had to raise the running stone. Okay. Yeah, that's, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. Huh. <laughs> okay, Mr. Charlie Bauer had called me up early this morning and he indicated there was a ship in town and a very interesting at that. And uh, I called them back and said, let's do it, let's go. We'll take the cameras and see what we can come up with. And uh, I think we've come up with a, a ton of history and uh, it's useful history, things we would never have learned in any other way. And it moored here in the Manitowoc Harbor next to the uh, submarine Cobia. So we enjoyed the afternoon very much. <laughs>